This is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to worship this morning. We're glad to have you, whether you are here worshiping um, physically in this space or you're joining us virtually uh, by live streaming or by way of our television ministry on WAXN Channel 64. We are glad that you're worshiping with us. Uh, we want you to feel like an integral part of, of our worship today, and so that I hope you will participate and sing with us with the words that are printed on your screen. We also want you to feel an integral part of our mission and ministry here too, and so I hope that you will find a minute, uh, locate the connect cards that are here in the pews in front of you or linked on the website. These cards are ways to indicate your interest in learning more about a particular ministry here at the church. They also provide a space for you to share a prayer concern and the hope and faith that it will be lifted by our prayer team. And if you have been visiting with us for a while and would like to make First Prez your spiritual home, you can use the Connect card to indicate your interest in an upcoming membership class as well. I hope that you also take a minute to locate the announcements insert in your bulletin today um, and look there for upcoming ways to put your faith into action here at First Prez and in our community. There you will find information about how to register for our Willard Lecture, which is coming up on April the 28th, when we will host well-known speaker and author Brian McLaren in our space. I hope you will do that if you haven't done so already. Finally, today we have the privilege and opportunity to thank our outgoing church business administrator, Wilfred Neal, following worship today. Wilfred has served faithfully here over the last few years, including seeing us through the construction project um, and helping us navigate the challenges of COVID. Um, he and his wife, Karen, are with us today. They're gonna be outside after the service. And I hope that if you've been touched by Wilfred's ministry over the last couple of years, you will take the opportunity to stop and greet him and to thank him for it. And now with all that we are and with all that we have, let us come before God in worship.
Please be seated. We know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and we come before God aware of our sinful nature. Yet our God welcomes us not as despised sinners, but as beloved children. Our God comes to us as both the incarnate and risen Christ and meets us wherever we are. With the confidence of God's children and with siblings in Christ, let us now approach the throne of grace, confident in the mercy of our God, who shows up for us, who loves us, and desires to be near to us at all times. Let us pray together using the words in your bulletin or on your screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in raising Jesus from the grave, you shattered the power of sin and death. We confess that we remain captive to doubt and fear, bound by the ways that lead to death. We overlook the poor and the hungry and pass by those who mourn. We are deaf to the cries of the oppressed and indifferent to calls for peace. We despise the weak and neglect the earth we make. God of mercy, forgive us. Help us to trust your power to change our lives and make us new, that we may know the joy of life abundant given in Jesus Christ, the resurrected. The resurrected Christ appeared to his beloved and told them that the forgiveness of sins shall be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, declaring that the mercies of our Lord are from everlasting to everlasting and extend to all creation. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. be seated. We rejoice with families who claim the promises of God for their children, and today we are rejoicing with Frank and Caroline Elliott as they bring uh, their daughter, Jane Holly Elliott, for baptism this morning. Assisting in the sacrament today is elder and grandfather Mike Elliott, and as Janie and her family come forward, I would like to invite any other children who are here today to come and sit up front here on the floor so that you can have a clear view of the baptism. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, we gather around this font today to witness to and to celebrate Janie's inclusion in God's holy story. For you, little one, the Spirit of God moved over the waters at creation, and the Lord God made covenants with God's people. It was for you that the Word of God became flesh and lived among us full of grace and truth. For you, Janie, Jesus Christ suffered death, crying out, at the end, it is finished. For you, Christ triumphed over death, rose in newness of life, and ascended to rule over all. All of this was done for you, little one, though you do not know any of this yet. But we will continue to tell you this good news until it becomes your own. And so the promise of the gospel is fulfilled in us. We love because God first loved us. On behalf of the session, I introduce Jane Hawley Elliott for baptism. 
Caroline and Frank, we come here today resting on God's gospel promises, and these promises come with an invitation to make promises of your own to your child. And so I ask you to affirm your faith today as you answer these questions. Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Do you trust in him? Do you? We do. Do you desire this, your child, to be his disciple, to know his word and to walk in his way? Do you? We do. And do you entrust Janie to God? Do you promise in humble reliance upon the grace of, grace of God that you will set before her a Christian example, that you will pray with and for her, that you will teach her to follow the ways of Christ so that she one day may claim that faith as her own? Do you? We do. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized. Do you, the people of the church, promise to tell this new disciple the good news of the gospel, to help her know all that Christ commands, and by your fellowship to strengthen her family ties with the household of God. Do you? We do. As a sign of that promise, let us stand together now and affirm our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. What is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, be seated. Let us pray. Gracious and holy God, giver of life, we gather at this font with gratitude for your great gifts to us. We gather especially thankful today for the gift of the life of Janie to this family and to this church. We ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon this water so that all who pass through these waters would be delivered from death to life, from bondage to freedom, from sin to righteousness. Bind, O oh God, Janie to the household of faith and guard her from all evil. Watch over her that she may grow in faith and hope and love and strengthen her to serve you with joy. Bless her parents with a home full of grace, love, and forgiveness. Grant them wisdom, O oh God, and vision as they raise this child with an awareness of your great love for your creation and strengthen them to do your will and to obey your word. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God be all praise, honor, and glory now and forever. Amen. What is the Christian name of this child? Jane Holly. Jane Holly, child of the covenant. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You've been sealed by the Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever. Thanks be to God. Oh my goodness, guys. Look at this sweet one. <laughs> this is Janie. Oh, thanks for making a way for me, guys. I appreciate that. This is Jane Holly. She goes by Janie. And she is surrounded by lots of family today. This is not the first Elliot baby that has been through these doors. Um, she is here with her parents, with her grandparents, and even with her great-grandmother, whose name that she shares. It's a wonderful thing to be surrounded by so many people that love you. I think it's amazing that we get to be a part of extending that family of love, that we get to be a part of the body of Christ who will help support her parents as she grows in the knowledge and love of God. And so I ask you to take a minute today to get serious about the promise that you've just made for her and for her parents. Think about how you might pray for this child. Think about how you might teach this child. Think about how you might know her by name and encourage her and pray for her and be a part of her life so that she one day too might profess this faith as her own because she has known the love of God through the love of all of you. See what love the Father has for us that we should be called children of God. And so indeed we are. Thanks be to God.
first church. The Gospels contain a handful of post-resurrection stories about Jesus. We heard one of the most famous ones last week, which is the story of Thomas, who demands to see Jesus with his own eyes before he can believe. This one comes just after another famous post-resurrection scene, the one that takes place on that Emmaus road. On that road, the risen Jesus walks with his disciples as they wrestle with the news of his resurrection. And Luke says that their hearts burn within them and they finally recognize their fellow traveler as they share a meal with him, a preacher's playground. Today's story though is a lesser known one one that on a first reading, I confess, seems a little redundant to me in the flow of Luke's gospel, a little redundant in light of the rich, detailed stories of Thomas and Emmaus. But I have discovered that there is richness here too, because here the gospel writer moves us from Easter celebration to Easter discipleship. As we prepare to hear it, let us pray. Gracious God, we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Make us hungry for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Listen with me now for the word of the Lord as it comes to us from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 through 48. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, why are you frightened? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Yet for all their joy, they were still disbelieving and wondering. And he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses to these things. Here ends our reading. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
And again, let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. When I was a first-year seminary student, I found myself in the pews of the campus chapel for a service during Easter tide. Easter is a season. The preacher got up to greet us in a way that I don't think I had ever heard before that moment, but have heard many times since, including just a few weeks ago in this very sanctuary on Easter Sunday. He got into the pulpit, and he shuffled his papers, and after a long pause, he looked at us and he said, he is risen. And to my surprise, everybody in the congregation, except maybe me, responded, and with conviction, he is risen indeed. We said it over and over. Anytime the preacher said, he is risen, everyone else in the room, and eventually I did catch on, responded with, he is risen indeed. And the service would move on from there. I left that day wondering what the word indeed meant to us. Situated there in a seminary community, I wondered, were we simply agreeing to a theological idea or sharing a belief we'd arrived at through study and thought? Or were we simply enacting a rote liturgy saying what was expected of us and on time? Or was it deeper than that? What, I wondered, did it mean for us to say, and with such conviction, that he is risen indeed? In our passage for today, the disciples are being asked to consider the significance of their own testimony. It is Easter evening, and they are in the temple in Jerusalem, wrestling with the news of Jesus' resurrection together, when all of a sudden, he comes and stands among them, and he presents his body. He shows them his hands, the same hands that had touched those deemed unclean, and had healed someone's sight with spit, and mud, the same hands that had taken bread and broken it and given it to them. And then he showed them his feet, the same ones that had carried him through Galilee, the very ones that Mary of Bethany had anointed with that whole bottle of perfume, remember that, and dried with her hair. 
the ones that had carried him ultimately to the cross. These hands and feet, they are familiar and they are wounded, bearing the signs of that which he had endured. And he stretches them out to show his disciples. In witnessing his broken, breathing body, they recognize him. And then he asks them a question. It is a question that a majority of commentators say is included in the story because Luke wants to underscore that Jesus is really resurrected in the body and not just the spirit. And the question is this, do you have anything to eat here? The risen Lord asks. And to their credit, his disciples answer, indeed. And they share with him what they have to offer. Only the living experience hunger, to be sure. And so the commentator's point is made in that detail about the broiled fish. The resurrection is real. But this question... This question on the lips of the risen Lord asks us to dig a little deeper, doesn't it? It is a question that acknowledges the persistence of human need, even as the good news is proclaimed. It's a now and not yet kind of question that invites us to consider how we might live right now in the face of that need even as we place our hope in the reality of the resurrection. It is a question, in other words, that asks for a response, not just in words, but in action, in our living, and in our giving. The risen Jesus does not stand among us, my friends, to be marveled at, but to issue a call in the form of a question. Do you have anything to eat here, he asks. The great preacher Fred Craddock tells the story of participating in a conference on hunger at Clemson University some years ago, and this is how he tells it. A Catholic priest and I shared the platform. The evening before I gave my lecture, a young woman began the program with a devotional. I didn't know her. She was a young woman, I would say in her mid-twenties. She had pale, blonde, straight hair. She was thin, she wore no makeup, and had a soft voice. When she got up to give the devotional, she had a yellow legal pad with her, and I thought, well, we are here for the night. (laughs) Everyone has one sermon. Her voice was low but I am sure she was speaking another language and she spoke in another language and then in another and then in yet another language. I do not know how many languages, the preacher continues, I did not keep count, but what she was doing was saying one thing in the major languages of the world. When she got to German, I thought I knew what she said. When she got to French, I was even more confident that I knew what she said. I suppose she said this one thing 60 or 70 times in 60 or 70 languages. It was one sentence. And the last time she spoke it, she spoke it in English. She said, Mommy, I'm hungry. And then she sat down. I thought about what she said all the way home that night, Craddock writes. There is something poignant to me about the fact that the risen Jesus hungers. Because in his hunger, he carries the hunger of all of God's children the world over and asks if we've got anything to share. In a world that is full of every kind of hunger, he asks Easter people to respond to the resurrection good news by embodying it, by showing up, 
by sharing our gifts, by giving what we have, and in so doing, rejecting an escapist, pie-in-the-sky, by-and-by kind of spirituality that has no concern for the living of these days, for the living in these bodies, by letting our very living here and now proclaim what we believe is ultimately true, and that changes everything, that he is risen. He is risen indeed. I cannot think about what it me might mean for us to embody our faith without thinking about two saints, a First Presbyterian church in Raleigh, one who was healthy, the other who was dying. They agreed on precisely nothing, not theologically, not politically, not even practically. Both on the session at the time, they routinely canceled out each other's votes. You could count on that walking into every meeting. And one of them needed a kidney. He was surprised one night to receive a call from the other who offered to get tested to see if he was a match, which he was. The local paper ran the story of their surgeries with a picture of the two of them in side-by-side -side wheelchairs, donning hospital gowns and giant grins. And at the center of that picture, you can see their hands. They're clasped together with conviction and with joy. And I'll never forget what the donor said to me when I asked him why he did what he did. We've been in the same Sunday school class for over a decade, he told me. And the guy drives me crazy. But I guess this was God's way of asking me to stop being so darn theoretical about everything and to try to live as if it were all true. And all I could say in the face of that incredible embodied witness was indeed. Such an embodiment of the faith happens all the time in big ways like that and in small, but all profound. When I was serving as a hospital chaplain in a New Jersey ICU, I made a daily morning visit to a patient's husband for about a week or so. I didn't plan it this way, but I happened to be there about the same time every morning. And every morning that week, a woman would sort of peek her head behind the curtain and set down a cup of hot coffee for him and then duck back out. She never came in, and so I just assumed that she was another family member who wasn't all that interested in talking to the hospital chaplain. So finally, I asked him who she was. And to my surprise, he said, oh, actually, I have no idea. <laughs> she's here with someone a few rooms over, but she's been doing this for a few weeks now. And I have to say that every day, this is what he really said, this cup of coffee feels truly life-saving to me. Indeed. Indeed, living happens all the time around here, too, in this body of Christ. I saw it clearly at a recent memorial service as members of our funeral guild opened doors and poured cold water and passed out bulletins and hugged the grieving and pointed people to where they needed to go, hands and feet. I see it every time someone comes to drop a meal off in a cooler that's sitting just outside our kitchen for a family that is going through a major life transition. I see it every time our pantry's shelves are being stocked by the same familiar hands. And every time I visit a member only to spot a stack of cards full of notes of encouragement and prayers for healing that are scribbled in your script. All of that has happened in the last six months, and I could go on. In all these ways and so many more, you have been and continue to be the hands and feet of Christ right here in the heart of Charlotte. You're witnessing in ways big and small, but all profound to resurrection hope here and now, proclaiming in your living that the risen Christ walks among us. 
and doesn't shy away from our hunger, but transforms it by asking us not to shy away from it either. This is a different kind of Easter message, isn't it? One that moves us beyond the fanfare of Easter morning with its brass and its lilies and flowered crosses and coordinated outfits. Thank you moms out there. Moves us from the celebration of resurrection to the practice of it. Verse 41 says that Jesus shows up into the disciples' Easter joy in a hungry body and helps orient them to this new reality called resurrection as he anticipates his ascension. Notice that Jesus doesn't speak from a place of impatience at the disciples' slowness to understand it. Maybe he's not even asking them to understand it at all, but simply to live as if it is true. Writing in the 16th century, St. Teresa of Avila echoes the risen Christ's call this way. Christ has no body but yours, she says. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands. Yours are the feet. Yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. My friends, we are the body of Christ, and we proclaim a risen Lord, not just in some far-off heavenly future, but here and now. And the question, I think, that is before us today is what we will do with our Easter joy in a world where children still say in every language, Mommy, I'm hungry. In a world where so many children of God hunger for the basic things that make for human flourishing while others have more than enough. The question before us today is how we will embody our Easter joy in a world where so many hearts hunger for friendship, for forgiveness, for encouragement, for a second chance, for hope that is tangible. The question before us is whether or not we will practice resurrection whether we will see in every hand that needs holding, every step that needs steadying, every stomach that needs a meal, every voice that needs an ear, the opportunity to encounter the risen Lord in the needs of our neighbors and to let our lives do the preaching with whatever gifts we have been given to the glory of God. May it be so in us, indeed. Amen.
You may be seated. And please join me in prayer. You are a God of possibility, a God of abundance, a God of new life, a God who is faithful, a God who is risen indeed. You are also a God who has known what it is to taste the harder parts of what it means to be human, to feel pain, rejection, hunger, and fear. And yet in this Easter tide, we give you thanks that you have claimed victory over that which is broken in our world, that you have conquered death and robbed it of its sting. And so with appreciation for the cost of your love and confidence in what your love means for our future, we come to you today seeking your presence and transformation in our present, in as big a space as our world and particular a place as our lives, knowing that you are already at work. And so we pray. We pray for peace in a world gone mad with war. Particularly this day, we pray for peace in Israel and Gaza and Iran as the fragile balance of order in that region hangs in the balance. Beyond prayers for diplomacy and calm leadership, we pray, O God, for you to make a way where there seems to be none, for we know that this is how you have acted before. We pray for our country riddled with partisan rancor, Particularly this day, we pray that the election season, which has already ramped up, can take place against a backdrop of citizenship and commonwealth rather than being defined as an existential choice between polar opposite visions for our future. We pray for our community full of joy and pain. Particularly this day, we pray for children and parents who dig deep to finish the school year strong. And we pray for those in our community whose lives have been recently weighed down by grief, for Harriet Long on the death of her mother, Mary, for Lucy Caldwell on the death of her brother, Raymond, for Kathy Presley on the death of her sister, Anne. We make these in all of our prayers knowing that our words accompany your purpose toward a promise that is sure. And we add to our prayers the words that your Son, our Savior, taught, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, I would like to invite um, our former church business administrator, Wilfred Neal, to come to the front. Wilfred, this might be a surprise, but you can handle it. Come on to the front. And also our clerk of session, Susie Black, as we present a resolution of appreciation. As Wilfred comes to the front, I will remind you that following our service today, there'll be a reception for Wilfred and his wife, Karen. It'll be outside um, in the beautiful weather as we say thanks to him for his service. My friend. Um, Wilfred, this is a resolution of appreciation that was approved by the session on the occasion of your retirement. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna read it. Whereas in December 2020, after interviewing by Zoom and in the heart of a global pandemic, a search committee hired Wilfred Neal to come on board as our church business administrator in the midst of uncertain times and facing a church-wide construction project. And whereas the aforementioned search committee had no idea how providential it would be to hire a church business administrator who owned his own construction company to help us manage a $12 million construction project that finished on time, under budget, and without the need of any financing. And whereas Wilfred has overseen four consecutive budget cycles, managed countless contracts, handled delicate staff situations, contributed 
his wisdom and pinch hit in numerous ways from the soundboard to the reception desk to the funeral guild and the copy room. And whereas Wilfred has endeared himself to his colleagues with a winning smile, a contagious laugh, a stalwart support, and resource for cheap lunch options uptown. <laughs> and whereas Wilfred has poured himself into a pivotal role in this church because of an evident faith and duty he has to God and to the church where Christ's love is made manifest in the heart of Charlotte, now therefore be it resolved that the session of First Presbyterian Church expresses to Wilfred Neal on behalf of the congregation, profound gratitude and deepest admiration for his years as church business administrator and affection for him as he transitions into retirement, time with family and grandchildren in a new phase of life. And resolved further that this resolution of appreciation be included in the official minutes of the session of First Presbyterian Church of Charlotte and that a copy of this resolution be presented to Wilfred Neal in worship by the clerk of session where the congregation can give thanks to God for his service. Wilfred, we're grateful. See you outside. Thank you. Thank you. Anna mentioned in her sermon that the resurrected Christ shows up hungry. One of the deepest hungers in our city is that for affordable housing. It's a crisis. Before Easter, we were approached by one of our partners in town, Freedom Communities, to see if we would be willing to partner with them in a 52-unit affordable housing project. When we got that invitation, we decided that we would challenge you as a congregation to give on Easter Sunday that entirety of the offering to support this project. We recruited some members to put up $100,000 to match what we hoped you all would give on Easter Sunday. So our goal for you on Easter Sunday was $100,000, and I am thrilled and grateful to share today that in fact you did not give $100,000, you gave $164,451, which means that we are contributing $264,451 to support a hunger in our community. So thanks be to God for you, and thanks be to God for our ability to be Christ's hands and feet in the world. Amen. And now with all that we have and all that we are, let us continue to respond to God with our tithes and our offerings. <clears throat>
are so grateful, O oh God, for the opportunity we have to join you in your work in the world as we seek to be your resurrection people and your hands and feet. So receive this offering, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Friends, Christ has no body but yours, no hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes with which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands with which he blesses all the world. My friends, let's go from this place to proclaim it in our living. He is risen. He is risen indeed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To the Lord. 